Hello and good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to another round of Saffron Say Cup voiceover talk show. It's amazing. I love Wednesdays, you know, because it's nice. I get to come back and see all these lovely faces. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's amazing to have all of you back here again. Um, my name is Giz Ojiako, and I'm the director for programs for Saffron Say Cup. And I will introduce my colleagues um, as we go along. I will start with Marcia. There you are. Marcia, if you'd like to unmute, please. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining us again. Saffron family, one more week. And as Gis says, yes, we do look forward to Wednesdays. It's our special day. My name is Marcia Reliser, and I'm the director for youth engagement and intervention and life coaching. Enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, Marcia. And we also have our big boss. Yemi, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Oh my goodness. <laughs> These names that you keep calling me. I shall have to sue you soon for calling me names. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure. It's an honor. And um, just to um, be able to reach you directly in your homes and in your workplaces in your cars wherever you are good evening good morning wherever you're joining us from um and in in this awesome global world that we're into that we're in i want to welcome everyone on facebook as well i am your host on facebook today as well and um oh yes i haven't um given you my name it hasn't changed it is still Okayemi Abule Eyantari, and um, it is an honor to have you. Um, have a lovely time. Please share. Please ask questions. Please um, ask some questions that might be difficult. Um, the idea is that we should all be able to ask those questions that are pertinent but are very difficult to um to voice out we have um seasoned um practitioners here we have seasoned advocates um people who work day and night to um ensure that people living with disabilities people shining with their abilities um continue to thrive so have a lovely evening everyone stay blessed thank you so much Yemi. And, um, without much ado we're going to get straight into the evening i will ask if everybody can mute themselves if you are not speaking and that is just so that we don't pick up background noise i will just do a little bit of zoom etiquette i would ask that um we be respectful in our deliberations um if we can share as much as we can, but if we can keep it as confidential as possible, um, knowing that we are out on a live platform. This has gone, it's been um, shared on, on the Facebook platform as well. And um, we know that the Facebook world is, is, is huge. So please let us be mindful of how and what we are sharing. Um, but please feel free to, 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 to tell your story because that's why we're here and that's what we want to hear. Um, we don't want you to hold back. And um, without much ado, I would like to do a mini recap from last week. Last week, we looked at um, parents living and caring with disability, overcoming short and long-term challenges. It was a mind-blowing session. We had our three guests on. Um, we had um, from the three initiatives, Star Children, Development Initiative, which is run by Mrs. Grace Alexander. We had Iyaniwura Children's Care Foundation, which is actually based in Ikeja in Lagos. And the proprietor is Olajumoke Otitoloju. And we also had the Abilities Project, TAP. It's a skills hub, which is run in North London here. And the proprietor is in Kiru Oido. So these were our three amazing guests. These are three remarkable women who are doing so much in the arena and making sure that children and families who have um, disabilities are, be, are able to have a life. So we want to say thank you once again to those three amazing, remarkable women who are on again 
today. They have graced us with their presence again today. So we are humbled and we want to say you are welcome. Um, I won't say you are welcome as in, you know, you haven't been here before because you are now part of Saffron's family. Like I said, the first visit, you become part of the family. Um, thank you for all you are and thank you for all you do um, to see that children and families with disabilities, you know, have a voice. Um, today, we will be looking, um, this is our third week. This is the third week um, of the disability um, initiative that Saffron Sacup is doing for the whole of March. And this is week three, and this is getting it right in COVID-19 pandemic. Support, well-being, mental health, community services, and policies. Um, yes, it's quite a mouthful, quite a mouthful, but um, it will be broken down. Um, so without much ado, I will hand over to Yemi, if you could please give us a little bit of, um, you know, if you can disseminate some of what I just said for those who are not in the know um, um, around mental health issues and the policies um, around it and the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Yemi. Okay. Um, as you rightly said, um, we are looking at um, getting it right in um, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, the support that has been available through during and um, also, hopefully, we'll still get a whole lot more support after because um, it is evident that um, there is going to be a lot of interventions needed for supporting um, people, families, children, adults, you name it, right after the pandemic. I do know that a lot of our social care um, organizations, statutory organizations are really looking to support families so we are going to probably set the ball rolling and find out what the pertinent issues are um, how they affect people's um, health and well-being um, their daily living styles and also mental health we have um, actually our clinical psychologist put up a post this morning she had a video up around supporting children and young people who have been affected um, by the pandemic, especially around mental health. So please have a look at that. And um, also around community services that are available for um, people living with disabilities. And hopefully we, we can have a look at policies you know, there is no way that we can actually, um, apart from social interventions, but to effectively pull off some of these interventions without the support of policies that are focused and targeted at ensuring that um, these um, policies and interventions are once um, effective, also sustainable, and also that we are then able to evaluate how how much they have um, been able to add um, to the lives of the people who are we try to support. Um, I also want to um, mention and appreciate, I don't know if I should let Mrs. Otitoloju um, introduce our special guests. Would you like to do that, ma'am? First, I will in, in, in can you just feel feel free no, to unmute you yourself? Do it, do it. You would do like me to do that, from, okay? Start from do it. Okay, um, we have on board today, and it is an, an absolute honor and pleasure to have um, Lasoda General. He's the general manager of Lasoda. Is on board, Mr. Mr. Dari Dairo. You on board, sir? You're very welcome. Um, we, we appreciate that you've taken time to come um, to speak with us, enlighten us. I do know that, um, for one, and I will always say that I know there's a lot of work going on and we appreciate um, the, the, the work, the support that your, your um, agency is doing out in, in Lagos. And also, I know a lot of also um, other um 
a lot of other states are looking to replicate the work that you're doing. So congrats, congratulations, sir, and well done. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, I don't know, do you want to unmute yourself and just give us a couple of words before we go on and um, come back to you much later? Hello. Maybe there might be some technical issues, but we also have on board the president for SIDA. So that's Mr. Shegun Joseph is also on. Yeah. Hello, good evening. <laughs> good evening. Well, it's uh, good evening here in Nigeria. Good evening. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I'm i sorry if um, uh, the background is a bit noisy. I just left uh, a workshop this evening and uh, I, if I don't do this, if I go back to the office, I'll get engrossed in work. If I go home, you know, family, you know, so I just have to quickly branch out the mall so that I can do this in peace. So pardon me for the background noise. Uh, well, when um, Mrs. Um, uh, Otitoluju told me about this, I was excited. And um, uh, she's been one of my strongest pillars of support since I assumed office as the general manager of uh, Lasoda. And um, uh, the agency is one that is... And... Uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, we're still grappling with a, a few of teaching challenges. Yes, I said that with all uh, sense of purpose, teaching, because uh, the general understanding of disability here is just uh, uh, struggling to get to uh, get the proper dimension and the proper, uh, 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 you know, urgency, if you were, you know. So, um, and an agency, a new agency uh, with so much challenges, manpower, uh, structure, and all of that. So it's still a lot of teen challenges. But we thank God still that uh, we have a government that has the political will to do what is right for persons with disability. And the one thing I always tell uh, disability advocates also is, um, in ensuring that we have a win-win situation in our hands, we must always uh, see how uh, the political capital, you know, of uh, disability advocacy, because it's important, you know, and that's the whole essence of the win-win about it. How does the politicians, how does government stand to gain from issue of inclusion of persons with disability, you know? Because probably if we can include that in our communication, we might begin to get a lot more interest. And not just the interest, you know, beyond tokenism, we might begin to get a lot more commitment, you know. And I think that is beginning to yield in Lagos State. Uh, I can tell you that the governor, uh, Baba Jide Songolu, has uh, <clears throat> just got, uh, uh, you know, uh, an assignment for the proper enumeration of people with disability in Lagos State, you know? And if you look at that kind of move critically, that is not playing to the gallery. It's not a populist move. It's a move by somebody who is meticulous, who really wants to, I mean, tackle the issue uh, holistically, because data is critical to planning, you understand? So, uh, and you know, the antecedent to that also is from, you know, the last um, uh, uh, lockdown, when the government wanted to do the palliatives, the governor was clear that they are going to uh, focus, give priority to vulnerable groups, the elderly and people with disability. But then there was a challenge and the governor was committed to ensuring that they get to them in their homes, okay? And then comes the challenge of appropriate data to really get to them. So I think it's from that experience that the governor is now instituting this assignment, you know, of which, and you know, to know the serious level of seriousness, it's not even 
uh, domicile in Lasoda. It's Ministry of Budgets and Economic Planning. That's uh, true, which they are, I mean, and Lasoda is just partnering in that assignment. So that tells you that we must, you know, don't forget where part of the reality came up, the issue of palliative during the lockdown. And, you know, beyond governance, you know, I'm also, you're also aware how that adds political capital for the government then. But they could see a bottleneck, which is lack of data. Now, now the, the governor is initiating this assignment for proper enumeration of people with disability. Now, but you and I know as advocates how important data is. You understand? So, and all of that was instigated by a conscious uh, commitment, you know, to really do the needful. So if we too, as advocates, start channeling our energy, our strategy, and our communication, how does this add to political capital, you know, for the powers that be? I think we will start to get a lot more empathy on their side and commitment too, you know? And I think that is part of what has been working for Lagos State. And I think uh, that's one of the things I would like to share uh, with us on this platform. Well, I see that I have uh, uh, senior, uh, more experienced people here. So I, I feel I've taken too much time already to this myself. So I'm just going to hide somewhere and uh, do more of listening so I can gain more from this experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please, please, please do not go away. Hide as much as you like, but please stay with us. Okay, um, and I do think- No problem, I'm still, uh, I'm still here. Thank you, sir, thank, thank you. you so much. And I would like to still recognize Mr. Shegun Joseph, the president for CEDA, if you'd like to unmute and introduce yourself, please, sir. That would be amazing. Is Mr. Shegun Joseph on? Yes. Please. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes, thank you. Can. Good evening. Okay, good evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. And let me say a very good one to Mrs. Jumoke, who invited me. I'm a Bushman. I won't have known anything like this is going on. And she really, really did a lot of schooling on me to be able to be here. And I must confess, this is my first time on Zoom or whatever. It's not my kind of thing. I represent the ordinary people, the indigent poor parents who are, who are special children. So I don't like coming from the more than all the, you know, the internet aspect. I like the grassroots. So thank you for being here. My name is Shegun Joseph. I am a parent of a 27-year-old autistic daughter, a child who is an Olympic champion, she plays badminton. And then having gone through the experience of having such child, even if she's my first child, my daughter, and you know, you have to put all, every necessary thing to make sure that she lacks nothing. You want to get the best of everything for her. And uh, we did our best until when we discover she could do more with sports mm. than either the academics or skill acquisition, which we have spent so much on. But when that came, when we discovered that, I decided to really, really put her interest in sports. And having seen what she has been able to achieve, I decided to put all my energy in sports and try to get the ordinary parent to begin to look in that direction too. You know, we parents can be so, so confused in what to do when we have this kind of children. And besides, of all the clusters of people with disability, we are the most marginalized, most, we, you know, because our children cannot represent themselves, so they are not always captured in the issues of disability when people are talking disability or making any provision for people with disability. So as at the time that we came on board, there was nothing at all 
people, most parents that have these children, lock them up in houses, you know, because of the way society relates with them. They see them as moron, imbecile, and all of these things. And then I have to take the challenge to push it back to the society. And because I just told myself that whatever my daughter cannot do, I will do it for her. So with that, I don't want my daughter to lack and to lose out in anything. So I took the, you know, the bull by the horn to make sure that she's always with me everywhere we go. You look at her wrongly, you are looking at me wrongly. If she has to say something, I'll do the talking for her. And if for any reason she feels anyhow, then you are bringing the monster in me because I must protect and defend my child. So that I realized that we parents need to really come together. And that was why I formed the Parent Association, which is the first of its kind then. And, you know, I have to go to all the nooks and crying to bring out parents. And for the first time, parents are coming together to realize that, oh, we have, in fact, at times you think you are the worst of them all. But when you come out and see another parent, you become encouraged. And then we have been rejected by the society. So we have to create our own social interaction, social everything, just to encourage ourselves and just say, yes, we will be the voice for the voiceless. And having done that, we began to interface with the government, really with other NGOs for, you know, and then it was really, really accepted. And then we thank some of the government, the past government administration who really gave us that support, gave us that voice, gave us that attention, everything that we, in fact, the woman you will think she's ordinary at the backside of the city without family, because I've come to realize that this thing has scattered a lot of homes. The moment it happens, the man will abandon the woman. So if I'm having my meetings, I could have 150 people in my meeting and 140 with a single parent. That is how bad it is. And my experience, I've even met parents that have two. I've met the one that have three. I've met the one that have four children. So, so we have a lot of challenges, but we thank God today, the awareness is increasing. We have institutions where they can run to, and we have the likes of Iyan Ura, who is doing a very, very wonderful job in reaching out to many more parents and trying to give life to our children. We thank you for that. And then I decided to put my energy in sports and to make sure that we, support, we create a lifestyle for them. And that is what we are doing. We're trying to get government recognition and attention too, to begin to look in that direction so that we can use that to educate the society about the positive side of our children. So we've had a series of programs and we're still coming up with more. So let me just stop there now before I forget I am. Thank you very much for having me here. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so, so much, sir. That was um, absolutely um, amazing. It was, you know, you, 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 you you mentioned something when you started and I, I heard you say you're not a fan of the modern technology and that is that is absolutely fine but I'm very very happy that you decided to jump on this zoom today because without that we would not know you we would not know your initiative we would not have heard your story and you're not just somebody who is working with children with disabilities you are somebody who is living and when you are living the story, it's totally different. So we just want to appreciate you. We want to say thank you for even coming on, for honoring us, because you could have said, I don't do Zoom, but you didn't, you learned it. So thank you. Um, and we want to appreciate you. Um, we, we, we do know, we have been told by Iyanua that we, um, that we that you shall be having an event on the 24th, is that correct? Are you still there? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. In okay. fact, but we're shifting it because there's an there's a situation happening. Okay. At the venue, so right. we'll be shifting the dates to a later date in April. In April. Okay, sir. That's yes. fine. Okay. Well, we will be in touch with you because we would like to support you, um, with that event. So, um, through um Iyaniwura, we will Saffron will be in touch, um, with you. Um, and just to say thank you, because yes, the, the sport is an amazing approach 
um, in helping these children that have disabilities. So thank you and please keep doing what you're doing and um, we, you will hear a lot more from Saffron um, in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, stay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, yeah okay so um yes j j just just to recap for those who you know who have just basically joined um mr joseph mr shekin joseph is the president of cda um cda is an acronym um yemi do you have the full can we have the full um the um full meaning Name. for those who are possibly listening from facebook go ahead Okay, I'm just okay. not only going to um, show you the full meaning, um, just um, we wanted to put up the, um, the, the flyer so that you all see it and uh, we're going to post it in, into the group um, page as well and um, it says um, sport initiative for differently abled. Can you see what I'm sharing? Can you actually see this? Yes, we can see. Yes, it's okay. there. It's there. Okay. It's there. Um, yeah. And it's um, sports initiative for differently abled and um, it's sports training for people with intellectual and development disabilities um, with focus on badminton and table tennis. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, we're looking forward to um, your program and we do hope that we have some input in it as well. So thank you so much. Please stay with us. Um, and um, and uh, Mr. Mr. Shagun did, did mention that the, um, the, the it says the 24th of March, but please disregard that date because Mr. Shagun has just announced it's going to be shifted to a later date in April and Saffron will be sharing the amended date. So if you have family out there in Nigeria who you can send to support this initiative, Please, please, please um, do that. Together, hashtag together we can. In order for them to grow, we, we need to support them. So thank you everybody who's gonna be a part of that. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Okay, um, we actually um, now, should we speak with Is um, Inkiru around, Is? I'm not, mm, no, Kira's not on at the moment, so we can okay. maybe go to Auntie Grace. Why? You're not even asking us to introduce ourselves. We, That's um, we're just that. coming, we're we're coming we're going to you one, one. one by one. So we're, we're happy that you've, um, you've yeah. voiced up, Auntie Grace, the, the court is yours. Yeah. I don't know, I'm lost. No, you're here. Yeah, you're no, here. Oh, we're okay. with you. Well, um, my name is Chris Alexander. I'm the CEO of Star Children Development Initiative, co-founder of Every Woman Matters Unit. We are disability advocates. Yes, we want to hear from you. You have the floor, Auntie Grace. So what do you, I'm, I'm lost. Please, you're lost, okay. I'm lost. Um, so what exactly do you want me to speak on? We, we've, we were waiting for you to speak about um, um, getting it right. Um, during the COVID and post and, and and post COVID as well, and also about initiatives that are working, um, some that we that need extra support, and also community services. I know that you're well versed in in those, and specifically around mental health. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, let's say uh, the impact of um, according to research, mm. um, it was um, acknowledged that. Um, uh, people with disability are actually affected seriously by the COVID. I mean, prior to that, they've always been disadvantaged in area of assessing health, in area of um, education, in areas of um, anything that has to do with them, um, uh, their their well-being. They've always been disadvantaged, and um, COVID has actually highlighted those social gaps. And even when it comes to employment, they are still disadvantaged. And people with them um, likely uh, um, that has um, 
small li li uh, livelihood, like uh, people who are into micro, um, small, medium scale enterprises, they are actually affected. And then um, and, uh, they've lost their livelihood and the lockdown actually, the pandemic which birthed the lockdown has not really been healthy as well. So for you to be in the house and, uh, and be not be able to actually be able to go about your business and that's the business you're going through because we have people who are graduates, we have people from the grassroots and uh, most especially women that the lockdown has really heightened their, their risk to sexual and gender-based violence. They've been raped and um, the perpetrators, they are locked in with their perpetrators and most perpetrators are in the house in the, where they are living. So, and obviously it was a sad case. And um, one of the thing is that uh, it has, uh, the lockdown, the COVID has actually uh, imposed um, what I'll call social risk and economic risk to persons living with disability. And one of the things that is actually lacking is the social protection, which is actually not accessible. How do you safeguard, mm. especially, especially children with disability, women with disability, girls with disability, youth with disability, how do you safeguard them? Mm. That's obviously lacking as well. So some people don't have access to, I think we did, Star Children did something on social protection. And we found out that the data, the social data that were used for, um, that were used for, what is it called? That were used for, for the palliatives yeah. were actually not really evident, uh, did not actually evidence how many people are living with Nigeria, uh, in, how many people living with disability are in Nigeria. According to Disability World, Rec uh, World Report, they have close to 30 million, between 25 to 30 million that are living with disability in Nigeria. So, and um, the pilot in Lagos, I had there about 2 million. And I want to greet Dari. Dari, hello, how are you? <laughs> so, and about 2 million uh, living. Good evening, and, man. Fine, yeah. thank you. <laughs> nice to have you on board. Really exciting. You, nice Wonderful work you are doing. Well done. You know thank I have your back anyway. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so yeah. So what happened was that um, I don't how many and Ogun State was missing in the social register. Hmm. Ogun State, a whole state was missing. They said because Amosun did not sign the register, and I would say Lagos State is kind of a trailblazer. They are trying their best, but must still need to be done. And um, so and what structure are in place? especially for people that have gone through a lot of trauma. I mean, prior to COVID, people with disability are already being discriminated. They, have, they are not able to assess, uh, just a little percentage are able to assess employment. And some people have gone to land jobs. They don't have access to financial support, you know, that they can. And we have love that, that they are brilliant. And one of the things, the cumulative effect, which has actually evidence in this period, in this season of COVID, is the fact that they are not, these people are not actually, they are, they are facing stark poverty if nothing is done. I know government in Nigeria is doing, trying to do a lot, kind of, kind of dry, trying to, there is a kind of political will, but it needs to be strengthened. They've done a lot of um, uh, like some of the stimulus that were packaged to give them. But how many people living with disabilities are actually able to assess that stimulus? That's one question. What communication approaches are they used? Because like I said the other time, disability is, is, a, is a wide spectrum. We have people because they don't understand that disability, we have disability that are hidden, invisible disability. And um, I don't know whether that has been put, that, that, that they have actually, actually added that to the stimulus package. How many of those people are able to assess that stimulus package? You understand? So a lot is uh, actually, a lot is actually, there are so many gaps that needs to be addressed. And one of the thing is that um, with COVID, our eyes are open to a lot of creativity, 
innovation, you understand. And one of the things I would like to say is that um, there has to be a structure in place. Like I was talking to Dari last week about the role of uh, the local government, because the role of local government, you cannot over emphasize the, the role the, 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 the role of local government when it comes to area of people living in the grassroots, people that are living with disability who are actually really, really disadvantaged in this, in this what we're talking about, uh, that structure. And even here in London, even though there is a structure, we have, it has been overstretched because yes, overstretched, the, the healthcare services are overstretched, but at least you know where you can go to. You understand. There are letters. They, some of the letters are sent in Braille. There are letters. They are sent with Minicom. Uh, you, you can assess the website and be able to use assistive services for them to for people who cannot even hear. They've used pictures when they send letters to you. They use pictures for people who are able to communicate through pictorial. Uh, through pictures. Some people are able to object of reference, you understand. So you have somebody who can explain to you what exactly they are, they mean. So they are different. It's not one cup fits all. There are different ways with which you can actually engage persons with living with disability. And obviously, uh, it, it's so sad because one of the things is that it has heightened the level of insecurities between people living with disability and people that are that they, who are non-disabled peers. What I mean that people that are not living with disability. What about the fact that um, uh, COVID, one of the effects of COVID, one of the things COVID has done is about technology, digital, you know? So they are disadvantaged in that area to people with disability in the sense that the money for the data, when you are living with poverty, in poverty, how do you buy data? to actually make sure you are. And one of the thing is that it, there is a, another pandemic due to this uh, COVID, mm -hmm. mental health issues. Mm -hmm. When you don't have somebody to talk to, when you don't have money to actually get data, you understand. And uh, within my group, in my forum, I've been able to at least give them money to assess, you know, to, because you need to talk. Imagine that you don't have that access. You, there is no light that you don't have that access, that opportunity to speak to someone. Even if you are feeling funny, you don't have that opportunity to talk and you can know what that will be. So there is mental health pandemic as well. So a lot, especially people that have been abused, you understand, who are, who are very traumatic by that experience. Who would they talk to? They do not even listen to them. You understand, they will not even listen to them. They will attribute their behavior to their disability, which is actually, which is, because people call, uh, communicate in different ways. So, and one of the things which we, so a lot of things that needs to be done when it comes to, and the government, like Darius said, the government don't realize that people with disability can add to the GDP of income of your country, because some of them are just wasting away. So what about the include? Um, what about um, how do we promote inclusive growth with regards to persons living with disability? Because uh, COVID has given us the opportunity to rethink the way of doing things. How do we doing things? Most of these children do not able to assess education. I did a program on that. They are not able to assess education. You understand? So, and most of the teachers are not even. They don't have capacity training for them to be able to even teach people when it comes to like e-learning. They said they were doing it on radio, but how many of them have lights? Mm. How many of them have lights? And when you do through radio, some children cannot learn through just hearing alone. You understand? So a lot of things are coming out and a lot of things are coming out. And one of the thing is that some children who are from the rich family or from the upper class in Nigeria, some of their children are abroad. Yeah, they are having, they are having everything that is settled for them. Some of them are taken to private schools, you understand, where they are able to assess those education, those e-learning opportunities. Some children need, you know, they are at home sitting because we did a program on, um, on education. How do we promote inclusive education during this period? So mm -hmm. it's about rethinking about what we need to do, initiating some programs that can build in some initi uh, initiative programs that can support a uh, person with disability, including children 
including their families who have lost a lot of money due to the pandemic, you understand? So how do we, uh, what about the special focus on PWD, I mean, per person with disability who are MSME, who engage in MS, that is micro, small, medium uh, enterprises for long-term growth. And part of it is that it's not about just promoting, giving them like promoting liquidity. Liquidity is okay, but how do we make sure that they are not able, when there is another crisis, they are not in deep shit again? How do we make sure that they don't depend on the government all the time to come to their? So what initiatives do we now build for them to be able to achieve long-term growth? You understand? Then how do we break the gaps between the law and practice? How do we bridge the gap? There, the law is there. The people with the, the disability, some of them, most of them, especially people from poor social, they don't even understand they don't understand uh, what the law says about their rights. You understand. So especially those people in the low, uh, in the rural areas, people, they don't even know what is happening. How do we make sure that we bridge, uh, we, how do we now bridge the gap between, between, um, between, um, between law and practice? What, what, how do we make legislation to be inclusive of social protection at sector that no one is, 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 uh, is left behind, you understand? How do we address barriers to support? Hmm. How do we address institutional barriers? Hmm. How do we address attitudinal barrier? How do we address unconscious bias? How hmm. so many barriers? Auntie Grace, you are throwing some words that I, <laughs> my English dictionary might not no, be able to we, handle. How do we, how do we, and then how do ah. we now improve safeguarding policies? Uh, no, that one is my line. Tell, tell us about unconscious barriers and systems. Unconscious bias. You know, some people will not know they are actually when they see people with disability, they've internalized it, mm -hmm. and they don't even know that's an abuse. Mm -hmm. They don't even know that's an abuse. You, you understand what I'm saying? They don't know that's an abuse. That's unconscious. So when it comes to employment. They don't actually employ them. For instance, somebody who is not giving you an eye contact, you think, oh, oh maybe she's lying or he's lying. Mm -hmm. But the person might have hidden disability that makes him not or makes her not to give you an eye contact, make lacks interpersonal skills. Mm -hmm. so those are the things that I, I, I think are, are, we can't be saying that, we can't say that all. And what about capacity building? Yeah, you you, sure. you pull something out around training and um, learning styles, and it is very important that, that exactly the learning so styles are communication pushed. approaches. Are they adopting com different communication approaches that make sure that we make sure that nobody is left behind? Yes. What what is good for A might not be good for A. Absolutely. And that is why. So there has to be an awareness how you relate to them. How do you come across? Okay. How do you call? So th that's why some of them might not be employed. Mm. Some of them might not take them seriously. Mm. You know, and the cumulative effect is that these people will continue to be discriminated. They continue yeah. to have um, a, a mental health issues and yeah. they continue to uh, to live in stark poverty. poverty. Those three things let, let me hold you there, Auntie, Auntie Grace. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to come back to you because um, I want you to elaborate on policies that have been effective and maybe some that we can I don't know the policies in Nigeria. I don't know. No, we're not talking about policies in Nigeria. We're talking about here as well. You, you have given us a whole lot of information around Nigeria. And I know because you do a lot of work out there as well. Um, but also we want to find out what is working in the UK as well. But before we come back to you, I also want to um, welcome officially Mrs. Um, Olajimweke Otitoloju and um, appreciate her um, contribution. You know, it is not easy and I know how <clears throat> busy um, people can be in Nigeria and it's not easy to have her dedicate her time um, here as she has and also to then um, be really tenacious in getting her guests on the program today, um, Mr. Um, Shekun Joseph and um, Mr. Dari Dairo. So 
You are very welcome, Mrs. Olajimakel Soloju. Please unmute yourself and um, let's hear from you. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Saffron. That's what we call you here. Saffron, thank you very much. I know. <laughs> I don't have a name in Nigeria. <laughs> Yes, my auntie has said so much. Auntie Grace, well done. You know, I always look up to you. During COVID. Thank you so much. COVID Your beautiful face. Our children, <laughs> especially in the health and their mental health area. You know, our children, they are the outgoing type. They are the social type where you, they want to go out. They want to mix with people, despite the fact they still discriminate, discriminate on them. They still want to go out. But during the COVID period, they were locked up inside. And that really affected their mental health. Even those that are not living with disability or that are not with disability, they feel caged. They were love, depression within people. Not to talk of uh, people with a uh, disability. And uh, the health system in Nigeria, in fact, COVID-19 brought up a lot of things that the government have been hiding from us. And one of those is the educational system in Nigeria. Another is the health management in Nigeria. It shows that uh, we have a long way to go in this line. But nevertheless, we were able to achieve little from both the educational sector and the health sector. Though not to not not the, the not what we expect from them. Like I said, during the COVID period, lots of our children, all our children were locked up inside. And uh, some of them were sexually abused, some were physically abused, and uh, some will I say uh, uh uh, they were not being fed very well due to the fact that their parents cannot go out, they cannot walk, and they have to manage with the little they have. Even that's why with the government uh, support with uh, various food palliative, I know we shared, I shared personally, my organization shared, and so many other organizations in Nigeria they also called NGOs like us to help them to, to share food stuff to people that are in need. That, as that may be, that's affected their mental health. And during that period, they went through a lot of challenges. Number one, they could not attend their physiotherapy their occupational therapy and every other therapy they are supposed to attend to. Even in case of emergency, they were not able to go out. And uh, during COVID period, the, the, the COVID era that uh, the, the, we had a total lockdown in Nigeria, just like every other country. During the lockdown, it really affected them that lots of them went into various challenges, various sensory behavior, and uh, it affected them. Some went into depression. But uh, you know, for our children, because they cannot talk. When I say our children, I work mainly with people with intellectual disabilities, so I talk more from that angle. They cannot tell you what they're really going through, even when they're going through pain, even when they are not at ease, they cannot talk. The only way for you to understand them is when they start bringing out all these sensory issues, all these challenges, probably biting themselves to ease out that mental tension they are going through. 
or sometimes they don't want to go out of their room. You talk to them, they don't want to listen to you. They scream, they shout, they start destroying properties, you know? And it's so challenging for the parents, which I'll say about 85% um, 80, of them are single parents. So you can imagine a single woman in the house with a child with that challenging behavior. There are no hospital to take that child to. Even when you take that child to a hospital, there is no medical personnel to really understand what that child is going through. So they just see that child as being probably uh, being a, mm -hmm. Uh, just acting, trying to seek for attention. That's what most of them, oh, let me say to you, Roma, my alone, Jerry, oh, when well, you told my Dalone, here, right here, you know, mm -hmm. trying to seek for attention and not knowing that that child is going, battling a depression. And when that child start biting, start destroying, start screaming, you know, all this aggressive behavior, the parents see it in the other way. Mm -hmm. And because our medical personnel, they're not really trained in that area. Even some of our psychologists in that area of managing people with intellectual disability. Of course, when, any, when someone without a disability goes to a psychologist or to see a doctor, and it's easy for that person to express him or herself, the way that he or she is feeling. And uh, it's easy for the psychologist to say, oh, you are going through depression. These are the way out. These are what and what you should do. But for our children, no. And uh, when they are being abused sexually, that is the most pathetic issue during the lockdown. They cannot talk. And when they see the perpetrator, probably that's when that aggressive behavior comes up. The parents cannot understand. The parents will just know that this child is screaming. There are no medical facility to take that child to because everywhere was locked down. And the medical facilities that were open, they were very busy. And before you get in there, you must get a COVID-19 test done before you have been attempted to. Though the government told us that uh, they are free for their therapy, but how many of them, there were no transportation to take them for their therapy. Now, after the lockdown, we complain to the state on these various issues that uh, we have seen. And uh, they now brought up another idea, okay? Let's support your children. We are going to have health insurance for mm -hmm. them. And with this health insurance, the clinics will be very close to where they live. So a child that lives in, a, a, let's say, in Surulere, you don't need to come to Lasut in Ikeja before you can receive your medical attention. You look for any hospitals within your within that area and uh, take your child for various medical attention. And the good thing that the government have done in this line is they also co-opt uh, private hospitals with this health insurance. So it's not only government hospitals you can attend. For me, I just told some of my support group, please go to those big, big private hospitals so that they will attend to you. But the clause we have with this health insurance is it didn't really capture most of our children. It captured the basic, but talk about the main mental health issue, talk about the main medical and laboratory test, it didn't really cover it, which we are still on the negotiating table with the state's Ministry of Health. Hmm. And uh, we hope we'll get the best in that area. Of course, like I said earlier, 
in my last in uh, last week that we 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 want to pardon the states for the ignorance i'll call it ignorance of the necessary things they're supposed to do because disability awareness is just coming to reality now. So we have so much to do to get the government's attention for the rights of people with disability. Of course, they have it in their paper. It's written in all various conventions that the, the Nigerian government signed, various treaty they signed on rights of people with disability. Even in 2019, January, the um, disability prohibition law was signed in. And uh, the government asked us to give us a five-year plan for it to be effective. It is going on now. And uh, part of it is the environmental inclusion. What I do now is uh, anywhere, go to banks, go to hotels, go to all these private properties and in terms of building. I watch out for disability accessibility in there. Probably check their parking lot. Okay, yes, they have parking space for people with disability. Probably enter the, go to the stairways. They have inclusion in that also. There's some banks you go into, they just tell you, like First Bank, you enter there. Not all, but they have their, their model, which they are using. The First Bank will tell you, welcome to First Bank. You know, mm -hmm. and you go into the uh, the security cage. So, with the disability law, we are watching and we are following the state thoroughly. You listen to what uh, the GM said in terms of employment and working together with the uh, Ministry of Finance. I personally have. Uh, discussed with the GM that uh, the secretariat, that is the legal state secretariat office, should also be a role model for disability assets. And uh, I'm seeing true. There are, you know, those buildings have been built about 20 something years ago when they never even considered disability as an option. But uh, when advocates kept, you know, hammering and advocating, you must include us in your policy. You must uh, respect our rights as an individual. You must stop discrimination. They have now started building leaks in all their buildings. I know uh, like about seven or eight of it now, and it's still going on. So as that may be with the Ministry of uh, Labor and Employment, they brought out a law, though the law has been on, but they ratified it with the state, go the state government, that's Lagos State, that uh, I think 15% of their staff must include people with disability. They're also asking for more. That fifteen percent is not enough for us. We are asking for more, and uh, I know within that five years we will get to another level awesome. of realizing our uh, inclusion, social inclusion. We come to Ministry of Education. That's uh, in the education aspect. During the COVID era, yes, we had a lot of setbacks. Mm because you know disability varies a lot some of those in that disability community they gained some did not hmm. because the state went all out to the extent that in some remote community let's say the riverine areas 
the, 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 the commissioner did something good. She did fundraising that uh, let's get a transistor radio for some communities that the, the rural communities that uh, the, uh, the internet is not really good. Let's get transistor radio for them. And they can listen to it on the radio because there was radio program at different times for different class. There was television program for a different time for different classes. And during that fundraising, I think they got over 10,000 transistor radio for those riverine communities. But as that may be, I didn't say they have done so well, but they tried because some areas were still lacking. Take for instance, my children with intellectual disability could not go anywhere. Hmm. They were at home doing nothing because most of them, they need that pictorial fact to train them. That pictorial uh, education, hmm. you have to show them pictures videos of what you are telling them. And none of this was available on television. So in that area, they didn't do anything. <clears throat> Another thing I, we went through after the COVID, after the lockdown. Yeah. Because I've had issue ones with the Ministry of Education mm. and uh, the permanent secretary called me Mm -hmm. She was my friend when she was in Sudev. Uh, she's my friend when she was in Sudev. She called me because she knows my passion. She sees my zeal mm -hmm. with my children and said, Yaniwura, how are we going to capture your children? Mm -hmm. And I told her, what we have to do is my children with intellectual disability, it is not that, it's a developmental disability. Let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. They can learn, but at a very slow pace. But with repetition, they get what you are teaching them. And we have some that are genus. Mm -hmm. We have some that are genus. So what you can do for us, let's have, you need to work together with Ministry of Health. Huh. Have the data of my children with intellectual disability because they go there regularly for their mm -hmm. checkups, either therapy, either medical investigation. When you have an interface with them, mm -hmm. they give you the data and we can work on that data to know the number of children with disability in each school. Mm -hmm. If that is not so not so conducive, I can call three or four advocates in disability cluster and those working in ministry with education line. We can mm -hmm. come up with a template, mm -hmm. and that template we send to all schools mm -hmm. to give you names. I'm talking about inclusive schools now, not special schools, to give you names of people or, with, or children with disability in your school and the type of disability they have. Okay. And when you have that, so next time in your budgets, hmm. include us in your They're budget. They're able to include you in the budget. The, mini, the, the permanent secretary was very thankful and she appreciated it. And we are working on on that template that this was uh, our January meeting. Okay. So we are getting there. What the government needs and uh, what I believe as an advocate is show them the right way to go. To go. See them where they are lacking. And uh, I, 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 I thank God we have listening governor. Mm. So far he's been listening to us okay. on uh, what we want and how to take the disability community to the next level. level. Can I suggest something, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
everything that you've talked about, you've actually picked out ministries that need to come together, work together. It puts a um, a spin on the fact that this is something that we've had to do here in the UK as well, because we also noticed that unless we collaborate and work together, hence we have a a, a, um, a national policy, um, actually a legal document, which um, ensures that we do this, which we call the working together document, is mandatory for us to follow the rules that are incorporated within that document. And I believe that if we then start to work together, uh, you mentioned Edu Ministry of Education, you mentioned Ministry of Health, we also definitely have La Soda and other ministries, Ministry of Environment. I mean, just name it. If we all then decide to come together and integrate, even if it's just the fact that we actually just start with people living, uh, children, adults, people living with disabilities, and we create this network of a circle of coming together to achieve the one purpose, I think that we would um, start something good. Because if we're all, or if each person is working individually, you cannot um, put that these this people at the center of your work. And information is not shared, information is not given, and it hinders the very good work that a lot of people are doing. So is it that we need to start looking at working smart to achieve um, better responses? Ma'am, feel free to unmute yourself. It's a discussion. Yes, are you talking to me now? Yes, I'm just saying that that is, uh, that, that from what you were saying, that is yes, my yes, humble, yes, yes, um, yes. Yes, that's, um, that's what it means, and uh, that's what we are working on. Okay. Uh, there's a project we are embarking on now, mm -hmm. is to see the social inclusion of people with disability, how we can advocate more okay. for them. That's the project I'm working on now, okay. which is going to start in April. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well done, ma'am. Um, does anyone have, before we, we continue, anyone have any questions? We've had um, quite a few people speak, and I'm sure that there are questions that have arisen. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, and um, voice out your question. Okay. Um, while we're while I'm still speaking, I would also want to welcome uh, Azamta. I I know that you work with Star Children Initiative. You're welcome on the program, and um, Chini, welcome. I see you. And um, thank thank you, Ma. Good evening, Ma. You're thank welcome. you, Ma. Nice to have you on the program. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you, Ma. Good to see your face again. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. We look like look, nice to see your face. Um, show us your beautiful face. You're a very pretty lady. <laughs> um, if... yeah, where I am is very dark, so there's no light here. Okay, that's why my, I'm not on video. Okay, so we appreciate your connection. Yes, then, ma. thank you so much. Okay. Um, can we speak with um? Is Inkiru thank you, ma. on board, Giz? Hi, Inkiru, are you there? I know she was having some issues with you. Yeah. Inkiru, can you hear us? Inkiru, are you able to, to unmute yourself? Okay, I think we'll have to come back to Inkiru in a while. She's on, I can see that she's on, but I think there were some connection issues this evening with the internet. Yes, we nearly dropped yeah. off a minute ago. Yeah. Okay, okay, we'll come back to Nkiru. Um, yeah, but while, whilst we're on, I just wanted to, you know, to reiterate what um, Yanni was talking about. And it, it was it was quite 
I was actually um, very happy to hear the interaction with the various ministries um, because in the UK, that is the way we work. So mm. it's nice. And I'm not saying for one second that we can replicate everything we do in the UK in Nigeria. Let's get that straight. Yeah, totally different environments, different governments, different systems. But there are some things you can take from here and tweak them and push them over. And there are some things we can take from you and bring them here and push them and it will work. And that is the essence of collaborating. That is the essence of coming together to work in partnerships. Yeah. So there has been a lot of talk about what you're doing, what is coming up. And as an organization and as the director for programs, I am very, very hot on partnerships and collaborations. It's what I believe in. It's the only thing that will push us forward. Um, the Ministry of Education you talked about. Now, you said not special schools. That was when you, you made mention of um, when we're dealing with these young children with disabilities, you are not talking about the special schools. Now, I, I, th I think, Yemi, you can, you can back me up on this. I think maybe 10 years ago now, um, there's been an emphasis or slightly more in the UK mm. of placing special, we call them special needs children. We don't call them disabled in this country. We call them children with special needs, right? So there had been a massive emphasis on placing them in mainstream schools. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what we found or what was, what, what, the, 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 what was seen in the UK is that these kids thrived a lot more by being amongst their peers, um, even though they had special needs. That might be, that sounded a bit like something Yanuwura was trying to say, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, but even if it's not, I think it's a, an amazing initiative for, for us to look at um, pushing it in Nigeria as well, because it works very well in this country. And um, it, 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 you know, it gives the children a sense of, you know, belonging there's no room for discrimination which they're not allowed to be discriminated anyway um no child whether they're of, of, of no child is allowed to be discriminated regardless of um their disability so yes it, it would be very um amazing if you could keep us as an organization informed of the developments we are very interested to hear how you get on and um, wherever we can step in as an organization to support, we will happily do that. Um, please feel free, everybody. This is an open forum. I know I have Rahim. I'm gonna come to you because your hand is up. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and take the floor. Um, you are welcome. Rahim, Yusuf, Olatunji. Are you there? Thank you very much. Thank no. you, yes, I'm there. Thank you so much. I First of all, I want to say a very big thank to the organizer of this uh, discussion. I think this is timely. Um, this is very timely, especially now you see that there are a lot, there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, opportunity support for different organizations, uh, for individuals, um, you know. But what I want to say, which I think is very is important, is that people with disability need to be put at the center of COVID-19 response in all um, sphere of lives, in education, in business, um, in agriculture, in everything that we might think of. You know, COVID-19 affected all human, uh, feed of humans and therefore. And I think that there is need for us to pay much attention, especially if there is need for us to give kind of special privilege. For instance, now, there are so many people, if we are to reduce poverty and inequalities, uh, especially at this time of COVID-19, at this, at, this, at this time of COVID-19, we need to, we need to um, advise governments so that they can, you know, particularly uh, give att pay attention to organizations of people with disabilities so that these people, it is this organization that I know they have the best way and strategies or now they can deal with people with disabilities. So I think if government can pay attention to them, in for instance, now there are so many uh, um, business supports that 
you know, is going on. Majority of people with disability don't have access to this uh, opportunity because some of them don't have access to uh, internet. Some have access, but they do not have the right information. And you know that not much of the people with disability are very much uh, have the knowledge of assistive technology that can really guide them uh, when it comes to application uh, for these opportunities. I think if we can really um, advise government to pay more attention, I know some go if they're Lagos government, they've been really in terms of education. Uh, most of the pro I watch most of their programs, and you will see that they have interpreters in most of their programming news, even in some of their lectures too. But not all states in Nigeria. There are so many states that are not really doing this, and it's affecting some of these people are left behind. So, and I think it's very important if you can emphasize that for government, it will go a long way achieving a better future for all of us. And at the same time, I also want to back the claim of the previous uh, speakers, especially the last one that talks about inclusive education. He said that uh, people with disability often perform well when they are when they are being enrolled into uh, regular school. I, I agree with that. I think what is very important when it comes to that is that maybe that you know there are some rare cases where it be, uh, most uh, regular school don't have provisions for. Uh, uh, students or pupils with special needs. However, after their early education, there's need for them to try to try as much as possible to be enrolled uh, to regular school. I think this will enable them to perform optimally in their day-to-day -day activities. Because when you are being, when you um, spend all your life in special school, it might affect your thinking, your reasoning, and all of that. It will definitely affect your life. So I think there's need for most NGOs to also work in that, especially those that are uh, having, uh, um, that are run for, uh, rehabilitations, some that are running hostels, uh, that have homes for uh, and schools. I think there's need for them to, to, to really work on that. So any puppies or students with disabilities should not spend most of their lives in special school. I think this will not aid their optimal development. And thank you very much. And uh, that's my, that, has been, that will be my contribution for now. Thank, thank you. you so, so much, Mr. Rahim Yusuf Olatunji. That was an amazing input. Um, thanks for shedding some insight. I wanted to call on, um, because obviously we, we, we have been talking, you know, about the, 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 the Nigerian, um, we're in the Nigerian bubble, but it doesn't matter because disability is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not restricted to anywhere. Um, I wanted to call on um, um, Auntie Vicky, who is um, a formerly safeguarding nominated nurse. Auntie Vicky, the reason I'm calling on you is because I know that you have knowledge of both ends of the world so you know but obviously you've been here a lot longer can you shed some light for us on and we know that obviously in the UK where we're at but you see we're, we're talking of the the COVID pandemic can you shed any light at all on um how you feel so maybe some of the the Nigerian counterparts can listen and get some ideas what would you feel would be um some of the um, some of the assistance that, that can be given to the special needs people pre-COVID and post-COVID. Right, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. My name is Victoria Mwosu. I'm a retired child protection advisor. Safeguarding children has always been my bread and butter. And I'm so glad listening to um, Olajumoke okay? when she was talking, when she was giving her presentation, she mentioned the fact that they're beginning to realize or put into perspective or as part of policy, the fact that children with disabilities are more at risk of being abused than healthy children. I think there was fear in me when we started discussing this because I'm thinking, hey, who is going to speak for these children that cannot speak for themselves? 
who's going to be their champion. So I'm glad that we are thinking along those lines. Perhaps from my perspective and perhaps my way of thinking, I would suggest that we cannot address every issue singly. It has to be supported by the government of the place. The government has got to put laws that professionals, carers, and everybody will work with. We can't do it alone. The government will put the laws. We will work together in cooperation, or you call it in partnership with everybody else who is going to be involved with these children. Because that a child is disabled doesn't mean that that child cannot achieve in another sphere of life. They may not, like somebody said, be academically inclined, but they're going to be useful in other ways. I was watching TV to join the army. This is in this country. And unfortunately for him, he was injured. He's left without legs. I don't mean leg, legs. Mm. He has got prosthesis to both legs. Now he is aiming to join the Invictus team to run. That's the way we should be looking at, you know, thank goodness that we've passed the stage of, because a child has got a disability, we lock him or her in a house and go out. We're beginning to bring them out mm. and we do need to work with the families, with the professionals. There's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of training to be given to people. When you take a disabled child to a doctor and you expect a doctor to perform a miracle, get is the fact that you being a qualified or somebody being a qualified doctor doesn't mean he's the alpha and omega. He or she has got to be qualified in the particular area that you want him or her to perform. Otherwise, there will be no progress. Mm -hmm. That is why I have been here for more than 45 years, but I'm still very much a Nigerian. I speak the language. I try to teach my children as much as I can. But the fact remains that we have a lot to do and I'm not in any way comparing here, but there are things we can copy like the um, director of programs, um, Guy said earlier on, there are a lot of things we can take from here to home to make uh, accept people that are disabled is not their fault that they are disabled. I think this is all I have to contribute this evening. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Auntie Vicky, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that invaluable contribution. And uh, I'm going to call on... You've just muted yourself, Giz. Sorry. I've just muted. I'm sorry. I'm going to call on Mrs. Grace Alexander very quickly before we call on um, Inkiru, who is um, re resident in the UK, to give us a UK perspective. So um, go ahead, um, Aunt Grace, and unmute yourself, please. Your hand's been up for quite a while, so I do beg your pardon. Are you there? Uh -huh. Yes, I just want to add to, I want to say something on them. Um the one where Rahim was talking about yeah. um, about education. I mean, there are two types. I think I did a survey around in 19, 2014 in Ogun State. There are two main, um, main um, ways of educating children with special needs in Nigeria. One is either mainstreaming, which means they can go to a mainstream school, and one is a um, special school. But I realized that most parents do not have some of them might not even have the right diagnosis. They don't have the right information. So that can lead to a lot of, uh, uh, that, uh, that can lead to where else can we place that the, the children? So 
there is no like educational psychologist do an assessment of needs of the education needs so and some of them once the child even though not every child that has disability has a kind of um, learning disability or what i'll call mm -hmm. ki uh, kind of whether their cognition is affected but what they do is that once a child is whether is the hand whether is the leg the next thing is special school and some mainstream school do reject them because of lack of resources lack of they don't know what to do lack of assistive um, lack of accommodation for that for that child i think i've experienced that where we have to the, uh, the this child was not some children they were not particularly happy and they did not have that, that choice and i told i did an event and they came and there was a kind of misdiagnosis, you understand. And uh, there was some expert there who said, okay, this child, because I'm, it's not within my remit to say, oh, this child has ce ce cerebral palsy. This, uh, there has to be a proper diagnosis for you to have a proper intervention. So we have to take this, these children to another mainstream school because we know they have, or else if you take them to a special school, they, it can de-skill them. So what we did was to take them to school and make sure that we make adjustments, just simple adjustments of the table and their chairs, you understand, for them to be able to assess uh, education that actually meets their needs. So sometimes the fact that the people here, oh, she doesn't look like whatever is called normal. If I try to come out open, you understand. They, mm. Then the next thing is to take the child to a uh, to a, a, a special school, which actually might not be what that. But sometimes there is misdiagnosis. Then secondly, there are no information concerning what do we do, what next. You understand? So that could be additional problems. Why some children have been taking instead of taking them to mainstream school, but that's the mainstream school. Are they aware? Uh, do they have what they can do to support? Are they aware of the uh, the resources that are needed to improve the the, the, the child's um, to actually support the child who need who have uh, additional needs? Do they have that knowledge? Do they have that information? So all those things actually affect a lot of parents with special needs. So awesome. that's my own addition. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to throw out a nugget before we continue. According to the Center for Studies of Inclusive Education, the United Kingdom only started um, accepting special needs children in mainstream schools in the 1980s. Yes, absolutely. In the 1980s. 1980s. So the, I'm, 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 I brought this out just to encourage to encourage us in Nigeria, it's not, it, it, 1980 is not long ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it's possible, don't give up, you know, it can be done. You know, I, I think to, to be honest for the UK, I'm gonna say it, I think that was a bit late because I would have thought maybe, but you know, it is what it is, it's happening. And it's not happening without difficulties because what that does, it puts a lot of strain on the existing um, infrastructures within the school. Yeah. The difference in this country is there is, there, 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 the, the, will. the money, there, yeah, there, well, obviously, but there is, they, they get a lot of funding. Mm -hmm. So I think when Ian Iwura was talking about, and I think that was Mr. Rahim said about the government, you are spot on. I think that the discussions that need to be had now and across the waters, because you've got to see us as your partners, yeah? I think the discussions that needs to be had are, you need money. It's not enough asking for these, the inclusions without laying out what you actually need. And some of these are very cost effective, you know? So just think about this when you're doing it. 1980 was when the UK officially introduced um, inclusion of special needs children into mainstream schools. Is it working? Yes. Are there challenges? Yes, but it's working. Yes, Yemi, over to you. 
Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I believe um, Auntie um, Victoria and Wosu will agree with me because for for years we sat um, side by side um, at, at various safeguarding um, meetings. Is the fact that we need to um, interject the safeguarding agenda into um, into the way we work in in Nigeria and um, because the safeguarding agenda is the umbrella and apart from that it also then brings and fuses everyone together. Um, Mrs. Um, Otitoloju actually spoke and she actually mentioned the Ministry of Finance and that was just key because budgeting like you said Giz is so essential and um, until we have a universal base for every child to start with, we can't build building blocks when we do not have a solid base. Um, this is so important for us to do that. So when we have a solid base, which is holding together with the safeguarding agenda holds everyone together. The reason why it works for us here, and I will tell you that is because when I sit at um, safeguarding meetings, we sit with the people at the top. We sit with people who make decisions, you know, we will all sit at a table, we will agree, and it's it's general general managers, it's directors, it's people who will then cascade the information. It's a, we don't have a choice, this is what we need done, and because it's coming from the top down, it gets done. So you have the partners that need to be sitting at that table are the partners who will say A and everyone says how high. And that's the way it works. And that's the only way it will be done. We tend to have people who have the passion um, in, in Nigeria, the passion to get it done, but who do not have the utterances to actually say, go do it. And people do not question. And I think that needs to start um, a turn around around that. Awesome. My two pennies. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Yemi. And um, I'm going to call quickly on Inkiru. Inkiru is the proprietor for TAP. Kiru, are you there? Can you? I am. Good evening, everyone. I am. Good evening, Kiru. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Kiru was our guest last week. Yeah. And um, like I said, Inkiru is the... Um, proprietor for the Abilities Project TAP, which is a skills yeah. hub in North London. Yeah. Um, Kiru, just want to ask if you could shed some light um, yeah. on the, the effects of this pandemic, you know, how it has affected, obviously you, you work closely with yeah. people. Can you just give us a bit of um, insight, please? Okay. Well, the pandemic, to be honest, the pandemic has it created a lot of issues. Um, um with regards to people with learning disability um literally every center in the uk has been shut down for a year they've had nowhere to go um i stayed open because i had one client and that client was my older sister so i stayed open because I, my sister can't stay home seven days two days in a row without having to go out because she would frustrate my mother so I needed, the hub was open March last year. Now, um, I've been in operation because I've had one client from the local authority. So it's been really hard because she's the only client I've had all year because everyone's afraid to let their, their, their child out who's got learning disability for fear of Corona. Um, so everywhere was shut. There was no transportation for anything. It was only by December, the local authorities decided to uh, give some family members, some families support by providing transport or carers to go to the house and take the, their family members out for a walk, take them to the park just to get some fresh air because it was so frustrating. Um, it, it's been hard. It's been really hard. Uh, you know, uh, my sister had to stay at home before it was decided. The local authorities were trying to save money. Um, it's, everybody's always trying to save money, but in the process of trying to save money, uh, they caused a lot of families distress because most of these uh, young adults or adults want to go out. They're used to going out, but now they're stuck indoors, not just one day, two days, months on end, um, causing major distress. Um, families have broken down. 
of, you know, even I know a family who the mother is now suffering serious mental health issues because she was stuck in the house with her child and there was no help for coming. Um, so with COVID, the challenges have been really great because they've closed most centers. Obviously now we're easing off on lockdown. Uh, centers have now stayed gradually. Actually, the main ones are not open. They're just opening little ones where they can actually go and they, you know, spend a couple of hours there. There's nobody else, no interaction, nothing. There's no means. Um, I've had, I have a, I have someone else who set up a hub as well for adults with disability. She's had no clients for a whole year. And you know how it is. You have a premises, you have to pay rent for that whole year. No one, no one cares about that. But what she's done is she set up something called uh, uh, brain, brain box and connection, whereby it's online learning. But th those who are like my sister who has severe disability where she's high spectrum for autism, you know, you can't put a laptop and say, come and sit down and let's do anything. You know, she can't, she has no re recollection or has no understanding of what you want to do on a laptop. As far as she's personally concerned, she wants to go in the car and wants to go out. So she could shout from, I mean, my mom's going through it at the moment, from 4 a.m. in the morning, she will wake up or one o'clock. Sometimes she's only one o'clock till seven, nine o'clock when her carers came, she was just shouting she wants to go out. So mom was getting so frustrated, but it was a case of, it's her child, you know, what can she do? But because we're here and we're supporting as her, her children, the rest of her children, it made it easier. But can imagine what those who don't have any backup, those who have no support, there are families out there that have nobody. And it is, it is very daunting. Very, very daunting. It is very worrying. Wow. Very, wow. yeah. Wow. Awesome. Thank you for that insight. You know, it's, no it, it's nice to hear that, you know. You muted yourself again, Giz. Yeah, yes, Giz, you're Sorry, muted. I don't know why I keep doing that. It's nice <laughs> to hear that the, um, it's not just the other side of, yeah. the, of the globe that no. goes through challenges, you know, and, I, no. and I'm, I'm saying this because I'm very, very passionate. You know, yes, I live in the UK, yeah. knows, but I'm Nigerian, very proud. So yeah. I really want it to, I want them, I want you all to understand that, yes, we are in the UK. Yes, we do get things done, but you heard firsthand the challenges that yeah. are also faced in this country. Um, with we 27th of March would be exactly one year the UK yeah. went into lockdown. We are reaching imagine for somebody with such learning difficulties to be locked up you know, locked up for that length of time it's it's definitely going to have some effect on their mental health so yeah. thank you so much for that in Kiru. um and you know i'm very time conscious i'm looking at my before clock, you continue so sorry am, sorry two seconds Giz. i am just going to grab in Kiru. um i know you've you've um given us this experience is can you give us just a couple of positive um things that have spun out of um this apart from maybe not the lockdown but even from your work that you do yeah it's i've from what i do i've given like my like i said to you i've only got one client which is my sister but her coming out that relief you can see the joy mm -hmm. you you know she might not be able to express it but she has that relaxed feeling when she comes because i actually with trans because of corona i was her transport so mm -hmm. i go i live in enfield again you know i live in enfield mom is in tottenham i drive to tottenham every morning every day i pick mm -hmm. her up i bring her to the hub five o'clock i take her back normally when she goes to a day center she's there from 10 to 3 but i pick her up from 10 and she's with me till five so the joy of coming out every day that was so much so by the time she goes home She's relaxed. She's mm -hmm. not stressing mom. There's no shouting. There's no, you know? So the, I've seen the difference in her over this period of this one year period. Well, nearly one year period that we've had. Cause you know, I've had her since that 27th of March last year. And this is one year now, but the joy of that real, and you know, the, on the positive side the relaxed feeling for my mom was a joy for the rest of us because 
because obviously you can see the strain and the drain on my mom. So mm. I can only imagine the strain and drain on family members outside, mm. aside from, you know, from that. But yeah, yeah it's, it, that's, that was one of the positives. It was, she was relaxed. She was happy. There was less shouting. There was yeah. less aggression because she can't yeah. get aggressive. There was less aggression. Totally. It was like zero. It was like hundred to zero, no aggression, you know, because every day she went out. And then some Saturdays and Sundays, mom would bring her to my house because I don't live far from where I have the hub. Yeah. Just to keep, even if it's just one hour she's with me, she's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Inko. Um, no. What I was trying to pull out um, with that is that um, each individual um, child person, and this is where we have the person-centered um, needs um, and individual assessments, their yes. needs, yes. what brings out the positives for them and maybe sometimes it's really very little but if we can just grasp that little um straw or and, and work with it we will probably be able to help them thrive better so i just really wanted to pick that up because you're doing an amazing amazing um work um thank, thank you, you so much thank you. Proud of you thank you okay mrs Ossetology, you wanted to say something i just want to plead that uh, I want the social workers that are on this platform, please come home, come to Lagos. Hey. We need you. Let's uh, let's support the government and bring the best out of our children, people with disability. We can't do it all, and uh, we don't have that number. Those of us that have passion for these people, we don't have the number. Auntie Grace is doing very well. I know. We want more people. Auntie Vicky, please come back home. Let's start from your knowledge. Please come back. Sophie, we want we want tap in, in Lagos. Do you know what? I think we need to um advocate for enabling environment in Lagos. Um if you if we're very well received, and um I think, and this is what I've heard from a lot of um professionals and social workers some people have come and had to leave because um uh, for better the better word um they don't feel appreciated listened to um you know we have this phrase and i've heard it so many times i love i love i think because um and I also think it it um, plays on two ways that um, when people come over, it's not because they won't come and teach a thing or two. It's because yeah. we probably want to integrate first, which is what we do at Saffron. We integrated for almost over a year before then you start to um, start to look at gaps that you can fill. So I think it will take a lot of more discussions on both sides. And there are a lot of um, professionals, social workers who want to come and do this work. We'll put out a shout and somehow um, probably be able to connect a couple with you because I know that between yourself and Auntie Grace, <laughs> some, some real intervent uh, interventions will go down well. So yes, we'll be working on that with you, ma'am. Auntie Vicky. Awesome. Yes. You wanted to say something? No, you've said exactly what I had wanted to say. And then sometimes I think the problem is fear between the two groups of people, the returnees and the ones that are staying over there. If probably because you've worked within the system, mm. you have got probably set ideas of how things could be done. But the people at home will resist and say she's trying to tell us she's a binto. It shouldn't be like that because at the end of the day, the focus is the recipients of care, not the two people quarreling to, to get their stand. I think that's one of the problems we have. And Vicky, don't worry, our ideology is changing now. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> we are not afraid to come home. We are not afraid at all to come home. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Can I say something? Sorry. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, it's not. Um, uh, anyway, I do come home anyway. It's because of COVID.
story. I like to I like to uh, work in Nigeria. I've been working in Nigeria, and we are still working. And uh, I, it would be nice to connect with the uh, Mrs. Otitoloju and see where we can take our advocacy. Because I believe I believe so much in systemic change. It's not about just community alone. It's about changing the way things are run so that we can, and it will be easier, especially for Lasoda too, because part of it is that Lasoda is, I mean, Dari has come to embrace a lot of challenges. And one, one of the thing is that I've, I've spoken to, I've, I've spoken to, to, to Dari and, um, and then with, with the three of us, we can think about what exactly, how we can strategize and see how we can change some few things. So part of it is that, what does it mean to, what do you mean when you mention inclusion? People don't really understand what inclusion means. Inclusion, what does it mean? You understand inclusion. How do we now include people that are living with the disability? And how can we make sure that people living with disability, especially our children, are not, you know, they are not just trapped and just be forgotten and they face a stark future. And um, part of it is that we have to put a lot of structure in place to make sure that no one is actually, and one of the things I, I, I believe in is working with the government. For me, that's key. They are the policy maker. They are the things that, they are people that can make things happen. And part of it is about lobbying, lobbying with them that a, a structure has to be put in place so that, and then two, the fact that the local authority there, they call it local government in Nigeria, it's the same thing with local authority. What exactly are they doing? What exactly are they doing? Where is integrated services? How can we practice making sure that people that are, have registered, that have registered with a local authority who are living with that are able to assess services that can improve their life chances? That's really key. So what if, how do we make sure that we, we take advantage of digital? So it's not like carrying file all the time. Carrying this file, they don't see what file, you, you understand. And how can we, we make sure that um, we, we do the needful? Putting some um, practices, disability inclusion practices in place. Having a disability charter in offices that so that people will know the principles and the framework of handling people with disability. So that, that, that's really key. For me, I'm an advocate. I love advocacy. I love systemic change. You understand. It's about talking. And how do we cater for even when in the community? How many? OK, when they say vulnerable, let's, let's, let's define what's, who are vulnerable because it's not one cap fits all. So it's not one thing that fits the elderly that fits a youth with disability. And their needs are different. How do we identify their needs to make sure that they can actually contribute to their society? One will be amazed, the intelligence, the talents, the, 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 the skills of persons with disability. So let's tap into it. Brilliant. And the government does not know that it's a place where they can make a lot of money as mm. well. Mm. They mm. don't actually. So what's stopping them from making wheelchair in Nigeria? What, what's stopping them from white cane, white cane mm -hmm. in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. But they are not concentrating on that. So how do we now change the mindset? How do we achieve that paradigm shift? So there is a lot of money when it comes to disability. Mm. And we will not be crying over spilt with that. Okay, now and then we have to change the, the 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 shift from charity to ability. The mindset of oh she's disabled. You understand? Even when they go for an interview, the fact that the person is not working properly, the fact that the person is looking and anxiety. You, you understand? The next thing is that they already the person has already made judgments, and they think you are weird. What is hidden disability? What is invisible disability? Hmm. So even in every organization, 
what's how do we apply emotional intelligence so that you are just you are not saying you are not doing your work maybe you are attributing her lack of not delivering to that disability whereas you've not actually make sure there is reasonable accommodation for that person to make to do her, her his or her work properly mm -hmm. effectively like the other one that's so right what is reasonable adjustment okay because the person cannot see does not mean he's not brilliant he's not brilliant yeah because the person lacks interpersonal skill is what is dyslexia what's it, you know dyslexia when you are dyslexia when it takes time to process information there are some people the brain the way their brains are wired are different so how we process information are quite different so so when somebody got come for unemployment and you are not you already you've already made judgments hmm. about what the person can do and what he cannot do I'm a proud mother of my son. You'll be amazed that he will sell you, he will sell you up. He will set you up. <laughs> I'm sure he yes, will. Yes, he's very brilliant. Prof. Yes, prof, wow. very brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Auntie Grace. Thank you. Always, always, always learning when, when, when you're on, you know, very informative and very on point. So we thank you so much for your input. Um, and um, yeah, we want to so just see. See, I'll add you more, okay? We will, we will connect. Yes, definitely. You will. <laughs> Don't remove you me in the setting or put me inside. Yes, the no, we are, putting <laughs> in the setting. we are not rejecting you. We are <laughs> together to make it together. It's really fun. Fun. It fun. Like, no, it's about bridging the inequality bridging gap hmm. between people and with disability and people that are not living with disability. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much for that, Auntie Grace. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, we have run out of time, but before we go, I do want to call upon Mr. Shagun Joseph, if you're still on, just to have the final word. Are you on? Yes, he is. Yes, yes you thank you very much. I'm on. Okay, Mr. Joseph. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very glad to be part of this. It's very, very educative. And then it's going to help me to do my job the way, you know. Now, one thing that's very key with us in CEDAR, we are looking at, we're very practical what we're doing because these are our children. We are, they are representative. And we know the key areas of their need to be able to have a very good life. We're looking at therapy. So we have collaborated with some doctors too who are going to be helping us give our children therapy services. Because what we are doing with CEDA is to make sure that our parents are not paying COBO. They're not paying any dime for everything we want to do. As a parent, I know what they're going through, I know what they feel, and I can represent them very well. And then we say children, children, children. As somebody who formed the Parent Association, we have adults, grown ups who are 45, ab about 50, and they're losing their parents. These are the only people they know all their growing up life. So we're looking at the area of rehabilitation too. So we're collaborating with the Medical Rehabilitation Board so that we can allow people in government to look in that direction. So that because most of these, two, uh, these people, when they are uh, uh, growing up, they've been cut off from the society, even from their siblings. It's as bad as that. They're only tied to one mother that they know all their life. And when this woman passed on, it's like, so they say, Mr. Joseph, what next? What happened when we are gone? And so we have seen the parents, we know what they are talking, we know what they And that's why we're trying to use sport, because sport, it, it has a very large followership. We are looking at the society. We're leaving government with their policies and with all the things that they want to do on paper. But we have the society there too, which is another big problem on its own. Whatever government wants to do, has to do with how did the society relate with what government wants to do. And so that's why we're looking in that direction, which sports we will get the attention of the society, we educate the society. They're going to be seeing the abilities in these people. And even the money we need, I'm not looking at government direction, we're looking at that same society, where we're going to make the society become friends of our people with disability, and then they will begin to relate with them with all the respect and care they need. Thank you very much. Awesome. I'm so, so glad. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. That is amazing. Mute it. Yeah, I know. I've just... I wanted to meet Mr. Shagun. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everybody. This has been another amazing um, session. 
it's just been very um some parts a bit emotional for me because you know we're dealing with not just people who are looking after other people's children we're dealing with people who are living you know and that 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 i i i have no words you know i'm i'm very humbled i'm very humbled um and what 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 i do want to say is you know I've heard the calls, I've heard the cries, come to Nigeria. We are coming to Nigeria. You know, we, we, are, we, are, we are coming. Um, we are coming not just because we have things to do, which I will talk about in a second, but we are coming because we are very passionate. We're very passionate about what we do. Um, and we do want to come and see where we can lend a hand to make this, you know, a success for every one of you that is involved in this. So be rest assured, we will be there and we'll actually be there in July. We are coming end of July for our safeguarding two day summit, which you will all be invited to. Um, as you know, Saffron Seikap is very hot on safeguarding. We've been pushing the safeguarding agenda since when, Yemi? <laughs> 2015. 2015. So in 2021, we're still on it, you know, um, and um, we, we really will ask that everybody you know, please look out for us. We will, we are coming. Um, in as much as Nigeria is home for some of us, but it's not just that. It's, 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 um, and like I will always reiterate, we are not coming to push the UK agenda on Nigeria. Yeah. We, we, Auntie Vicky said it earlier. We want to be, we want, we want, we want to do this. You see my fingers, you know. So we want to merge and this is what we're going to do, okay? So we'll learn from you, you'll learn from us and the outcomes for these special children because that's what they are and special adults is what we're going to seek to achieve, okay? Next week is our last week on disabilities. Please everybody, I'm on my knees, come back. <laughs> I don't want someone to end. This is, you know, we've had January, we had relationships, February, we had finance. But this March has just been amazing. And, you know, I don't want to say goodbye to everybody yet. So please, 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 all of you come back and stay with me next week, Wednesday. <laughs> I would love to have all of you back um, so that we can round up um, and we will celebrate because that would be one year the UK went into lockdown. So come back, celebrate with us. Let's get out of this lockdown. Let me get on a plane and get out of here for a couple of weeks. Yes. So, anyway, yeah, without much ado, thank you so much to all our special guests, Auntie Grace Alexander, Madam Alajumike Otitoloju, I hope I said that right, Mr. Shegun Joseph, thank you so much, and Kiru Oyudo, and my darling friend has gone, Mr. Rahim Yusuf Olatunji, please, please, thank please, thank you so much, and all our Facebook family who have been watching, um, thank you so much. Um, as always, you're always on point, always there supporting us. And to everybody on this platform, we've got so many new names. Ajayi Modupe, welcome. Thank you. Asamta, we've actually called you out. Thank you so much for coming on. Ido Bello, thank you. Muridin, oh, I saw you sneak in, bro. I saw you. Welcome, <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and to all our regulars, my ever-loving sister, Marcia, Eliza, you know I love you. Thank you for always being here with us. And to my boss, I'm signing off now, everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs> Hold on. I really need to um, appreciate um, Debbie. Um, she's our clinical um, child psychologist. She's actually taking the fort on um, Facebook oh. because I just couldn't keep up. But um, she has been on there. And um, thank you, Debbie, for holding the fort out there. Um, and I just wanted to say, hi, Debs. Hi, Debs. <laughs> she's she's out there. Marcia, awesome. Thank you. Um, Chini, Giz twin sister. Good to oh, see you. You doubled up. I had to check that um, she hadn't um, replicated herself. Um, but yes, it's uh, been an awesome evening. Um, if you want our contact details, just please go just um, go on to our web pages. Um, that's Saffron SACAP, Saffron S A C A P. Put that on the internet, everything comes out. Also in Nigeria is Saffron S D G F. Web pages all operational. Find us there, send us emails, and we are replying within six hours. 
Okay. Yes. And, and so quickly, just quickly before we go, please, please share. Whenever we come on, there will be people who would have missed this session who probably need it as well as everybody on here. Um, you, please share. Sharing is caring. If God is going to bless us, we need to be a blessing to everybody else. So please, please, please have a good night, everybody. Stay safe. See you all next week. Next week. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. And meet yourselves. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye. bye. Thank you.